And so I'm Roger Halen, I'm a senior scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory. I've been here for 19 years. And I study visual ecology of cephalopods. And that's, we do it in the field and we do it in the laboratory. But it was Vietnam era and it was draft time and army time and I went into the military and served my time. But I discharged in Korea overseas and then I went and sort of dived the world for a year on my own. And that's where I really got totally immersed, pardon the pun, into marine biology. So I dived all over Micronesia, Indonesia, Australia, places like that. And that's where I really made my mind up that I wanted to do this for a career. Nineteen ninety-five, I arrived here as the first director of the Marine Resources Center. I performed that function for eight years and we developed that new facility and got the user community tuned in, started my own research program and got things really rolling. Then I resigned from that position and concentrated on my research. What brought me here was the Marine Resources Center building and facility where I could have a state-of-the-art seawater controlled system to do live animal experiments with high quality seawater and beautiful laboratories immediately adjacent. The building was built to do the kind of research that I have done for a long time. So the facility itself was a big draw, but equally or more so was the uh, intellectual environment at the MBL and the history of the MBL. I had taught a course here in scientific mariculture for about six or seven years, I've forgotten how long. So I visited often and I was inspired by the place and I was working in a medical school and a marine biologist in the medical school is a duck out of water. My training is really in ethology, animal behavior. The sensory side of it only came along because I was particularly interested in adaptive coloration in my animal group of cephalopods and fishes, and that's mostly mediated by the visual system, and that drew me in to vision research. I was not doing vision research before I got here. When I got here, I started looking at the functional morphology of adaptive color change, and that means the sensory control system, that's vision, and the motor output system, which is the skin and all the coloration elements. And to this day, those are the two general areas that I spend a lot of time on. It's certainly true for the papillae, the skin papillae, that, you know, the morphing skin, like ultimate goosebumps. And that is visually mediated. We published on that, as you uh, said just now. However, uh, there's a second part of our research that I think is potentially very exciting, and that is that, yes, this is visually controlled, not tactilely uh, mediated, but we think that there is light sensing going on in the skin for some aspect of this system. And that is active research. We're funded on that. We've been working on it very hard for three years. It's very difficult research. We don't have any answers even after three years. But we, we do have a lot of evidence that they have the equipment, the, the anatomical chemical equipment in the skin that is also found in the retina of the animal to detect light. So either we have a tiger by the tail or we're dealing with a total red herring, and that's how research is, and I can't tell you the answer. But yes, you, you could call that visual anyway. It's just not imaging you know, types of vision. It's handling of light to the skin which will, if proven, will garner a lot of interest in the vision research community. But I can't say anything definitive today. So the opsin molecule, which transduces light part of the visual cascade in the retina of this animal, uh, the gene for that opsin molecule we have found distributed in the skin of the cuttlefish and the squid. 
So not only have we found that option molecule, we found some of the adjacent visual molecules that are needed to handle light. They're, they are all present, but we only know they're present sort of genomically. We, we know that the cells are there, we know that the genes for that cascade are there, but we don't have any sort of physiological evidence that they're actually receiving and doing anything with light. That has really been hard to do. We haven't done it yet. But it would be pretty unusual if all of that eloquent equipment was in place in the skin and they weren't actually doing something with it for light. Um, there's a lot of continual onboard processing, visual processing going on in these animals all the time. And they do have some rather elegant and unusual ways of performing motion camouflage, which well, what I mean by that is how to maintain some form of camouflage while you are moving. And that takes a lot of visual perception for the animals to calculate how to do that. For example, they do what we call the moving rock trick. So the animal will puff itself up kind of in the shape, this is an octopus, in the shape of a rock or a coral head and get the coloration and the pattern and everything in good shape looking like a rock or a coral. It will hold all that and then tippy toe across the substrate. When you don't see much motion in the tippy toeing of their eight arms and their two arm suckers, but the animal's moving across an open space, for example. So it looks a bit like a rock, but it's moving. But here's the cool thing, which we've not proven, but again is really very interesting, is that on a, on a windy, sunny day in shallow water, there's a lot of motion from the ripple and reflections of the sunlight on the waves, right? And so when there's a lot of that in the background, the octopus moves quickly, more or less at the same speed of the false motion in the background from the light flicker. When it's a calm day or cloudy, they take forever to go across an open area. So the animals are calculating, assessing the amount of visual motion in the background and adjusting their speed of motion accordingly. And that's what brains are for. That's, that's a very ongoing, elegant set of sensory motor actions. And I find that to be one of the most exquisite things these animals do. How do they achieve colorblind camouflage is a really key question to us too. And so what I mean by that is the animals are colorblind by all the testing we and others have done. Okay, given that they're colorblind, and I'm not convinced that they are, but all the evidence shows that there's no known mechanism. How do they get their color right in their pattern? Because most of their predators are color competent, and some of them are very color competent. You know, teleos fishes with tetrachromatic vision, four color receptors versus three. We have three. Four is exponentially more color discrimination. So I can show you literally tens of thousands of images, and the color match looks really good, and we are measuring that with hyperspectral imagers and other things. But, how are they getting the color right? And against so many backgrounds that you find on a coral reef, one of the most colorful habitats on the planet, or a kelp forest, the answer is, don't know. But it's a really intriguing question about vision and visual perception. The other side of me that I think is important here is that visual ecology is sort of what I and some of my colleagues fit into. What does that mean? I'm, I'm a field biologist, primarily. I do a lot of lab experiments and skin and cell work, but that's, to me, in my mind, that's an augmentation of what's happening in nature. So I go out in the e ecological setting of the animal sensory world, and I study their behavior there and some of their visual capabilities in the field. Then I formulate my questions there to bring into the laboratory to test. That's my philosophy of this kind of work. So when I call, call it visual ecology, which is a, a very new term, <laughs> uh, we're looking at how vision works in the ecological context in which it does work. So it's the vision of the animal because it has to find things and it has to adapt its camouflage to different backgrounds. But we're also interested in the visual perception of the predators looking at the camouflage 
cuttlefish or octopus or squid. And so we're studying both aspects of that visual predator-prey interaction in an ecological, real-life context. And sometimes we reconstruct those environments in the Marine Resources Center. And there's another big draw to, to what's home. So what got me on to this strange line of thinking? Uh, first of all, uh, if you look at the, the, the history of biology and camouflage, it's a very unusual history. Camouflage was studied by two or three very influential books in the early 1900s uh, and mid-1900s. Then nothing happened. So I'm, I'm, I'm fond of glibly saying that camouflage is the least studied subject of biology that we think we already know about, because people just think camouflage is looking like the background. But for years, I'm going underwater and I'm studying an octopus and a cuttlefish and following it around in these visual backgrounds, and I'm marveling at how fast they can change. They move to a new spot, assess the visual field, in a quarter of a second or one second at the longest, they've nailed it, and they just almost vanish from view. Well, how do they do it so fast? That's a key question, a key neurobiological behavioral question that no one had addressed. So for years, I did a lot of field work and lab work and was thinking about this. And then I finally said, well, how many patterns does a cuttlefish have? Well, this gets to the history question because no, I have never found in the literature, I wish someone would show me if it's there, I've never heard of anyone addressing the question of how many camouflage patterns there are on planet Earth. Or for a cephalopod, or for a flatfish, or for a chameleon for a bird or anything you want to name. People just haven't gotten to that question of how many camouflage patterns there are. And that question intrigued me because it's a central part of natural selection. <laughs> and it's in many taxa and it's in every habitat, every visual habitat. So I looked at our animals and I said, there's got to be a trick. There's got to be some parsimonious solution to what looks like a very complicated problem. And by taking photographs of animals, I did this during my postdoc in the 80s, I just took a, a few hundred pictures of camouflaged cuttlefish and said, well, how many are there? i got to write something about this. So with artistic license, I just started making some piles on the floor like I'm in kindergarten. And there were about five piles I came up with initially. And I looked at those real hard and thought about them, talked to my colleagues. And then we looked at that and said, well, this could be three piles or five piles. I don't care if it's three or five piles. What I'm sure is that it's not 50 or 500 piles. As I now have well over 100,000 images and have looked at images all over, I can still use artistic license to bend those into very few categories on the order of three to five. What does this mean? So, so it got us onto the visual perception side of it. We simply thought, if they can change so fast and make all this decision in complicated backgrounds, and if they only have three to five patterns, that means they might only need one simple visual cue to turn on pattern one and another cue for pattern two and so forth. And that would streamline the system. So that's what we test in the laboratory. And the test seems to be holding up, which is to say that they're ignoring most of the visual information available to them at any one time and looking for one visual cue, and if they see it, that tells them to turn on pattern template one. And that's basically what our 25 experimental papers in the last five or six years show. So we have some data to support that idea. Now, internally in the brain, we don't know how that's happening, but I don't have to deal with that at the moment. I can treat the brain as a black box for the following reason. These animals are genetically predisposed to take any visual information they have and try to camouflage because it's defense number one in their soft body. So we exploit that in the lab and we give them those crazy backgrounds and we quantify those. And we quantify the output because how they appear in their camouflage pattern is the answer. And so we take their pattern and we quantify that. So now we've quantified in and out of the brain and we can come up with those visual cues. And that's essentially we're writing an algorithm for the eye of a cuttlefish that guides this fast camouflage system. And the algorithm more or less is that to turn on the disruptive pattern, they're looking for light or white elements in the background against a dark background that are about the size of white elements they can put physiologically in their skin and that tells them to turn on one class of patterns that we call disruptive patterns. 
And it's little, that's a simplification, but it's basically the idea. So, so experimentally, in this one animal, this seems to work. We've done it over and over again. It's very repeatable. To extrapolate that to other animals is what we're doing now with fishes and others. And this requires us to quantify camouflage. Well, no one's ever quantified camouflage. It turns out to be really hard to do. You can quantify color rather easily. You can quantify contrast and brightness. Uh, you can quantify what some people will call texture, my least favorite term in all of vision science because it means something different to every single person. But pattern is the tough part. Pattern analysis is a very difficult thing to do. And that's what we're addressing is the pattern design. So how do you relate pattern designs in nature to the pattern design of the animal to camouflage itself? Because if you get color, contrast, brightness, and other things squared away for your camo, but the pattern's wrong, the predator visual system picks it up, your lunch, you're out of the gene pool, and you flunked evolution. Natural selection doesn't work. So our animal group has allowed us to uh, approach bigger questions because this is the animal group that evolved very strangely to depend more on camouflage and it shows the most pattern diversity and the fastest change on the most complex visual habitats on the planet. So it's like an extreme example of a capability. And we would think that those conserved features can be seen in this animal group. And we're wondering if those conserved features are extracted to other animal patterns. And that's our big picture of what we want to do. We'd like to see if this does apply as a conserved feature of how camouflage patterns deceive visual predator systems. And that's the big picture of what we do. So our view of this is not very molecular or cellular, it's more ecological and behavioral. But we can ask those questions with this animal because our animal provides those answers very easily. It's a big global look at the system and how it works ecologically, and you can move backwards all the way into the neural equipment, and we do some of that too. But our emphasis is on behavior and ecology and looking how vision works into that. So a primary tool of ours is the psychophysics approach. Strange term, I don't even really know where it came from. Uh, but essentially you give the animal crazy backgrounds that you create like checkerboards. Totally unnatural patterns. And the concept here is that you can control the visual input. And you can look at the result in the skin and you can begin to relate little bits and pieces or big bits and pieces of the animal skin pattern to very specific visual stimuli. So we want to know exactly which visual stimuli out there that the animal sees is turning that pattern on. And you can do that with natural backgrounds, but they're too complicated, you can't control them. So we do them with unnatural backgrounds, the psychophysics approach, to do it piece by piece. So that's why we have to do hundreds of experiments and it takes forever and a day to get the data. Um, we've, we've scraped the cream off the top in the last five to eight years. We know basically which of the criteria in the background turn on each of the three pattern types as we define them. But, and that accounts for the speed. But there's a big block of research that's important that we don't know about and that is how do they fine tune each of those pattern templates because I stress that if biology can be characterized by any one thing, it's all that variability. Variability is a key part of biology. And so, yes, we have three pattern types, and I believe that, and we could show that with certain metrics, but there's a lot of variability on each pattern type and how they, how they turn on those finer details of the pattern variation is what we're approaching now, but that will be a very long-term project. That will take decades, way after I'm out of the game. Um, but we're beginning it. So, so we're excited that we have come across a new way to look at this. What I just explained to you is um, very counterintuitive that they would have very few patterns to go in such diverse backgrounds. Most people don't believe that or have a real tough time and need a lot of data to even consider the idea. It's controversial. I've published this. It is controversial. Great. Show me a better solution. And that's how science works, right? So that's where we are. Well, we had a true eureka moment. 
in my lab that I will never forget. This was in February 2005, and it was a Sunday, and I had a colleague from California, Charlie Chubb, and another colleague here uh, from Taiwan, and we had a few folks in the lab. We were trying to crack a very difficult question about camouflage. We were trying to produce a checkerboard background that would produce a mottled camouflage pattern. That was one of the three pattern types. And we thought that was going to be the easiest thing to do. So we left it sort of towards the end of our initial three years of experiments, but we could never get a pure camouflage mottled background. We would always have it sort of contaminated, if you will, with some disruptive white squares or something. And Charlie Chubb and the rest of us sat down on the Sunday and brainstormed this again for about an hour, and finally Charlie said, I think if I tweak this, we might get the right one. So he got on and did it in MATLAB, created the pattern. I took the pattern, I walked down the hall, I put it in the tank system design, I set up the lights, the camera, I took the cuttlefish, I put it down, I plopped it at the bottom, and it produced this perfect, pure, mottled pattern. And I literally just kind of screamed, we got it, went running down the hall, and everyone came down. It was like after hundreds of experiments over several years, he nailed it right in Sunday afternoon, just after a brainstorm session. You know, and it was just, that led to, that was a breakthrough for us because we really uh, understood our algorithm better. It led to better experiments, and it got us over this hump where we had really reached a roadblock for almost a year and a half. So I think that was a really exciting time. None of us will ever forget it. It just seems kind of nerdy, but when you think of how much frustration behind it, we finally nailed the right visual information to stimulate this pattern. That was really a very big deal. I did have one other really important Eureka moment, but it wasn't in Woods Hole. It was on my field trip while I was working here. and I was diving in Grand Cayman Island and was following this octopus, and I was the predator. I was being the predator on purpose. And on one of my approaches to the animal, it was the fifth time in 45 minutes I sort of attacked this animal. I attacked it only with the camera to see how it responded. But this time I didn't attack. I came in extremely slowly to the animal. And I got to the point where the camera, the dome thing, was just inches from the octopus before it finally decided to go out of camouflage and take off. And that video sequence I got was just mind-blowingly beautiful through the lens, and I knew I got something that was just visually stunning, and I just sort of screamed, but then the octopus took off, and I had to sprint and go after it. But as soon as the session was over, I leaped out of the water, it was only like five feet, and I screamed, bloody murder, man, I think I got a great shot. <laughs> the dive boat and my dive partner all thought I was having a dive emergency. And so I said, no, no, I'm okay, I gave the signal. I said, but I think I got something really hot. Well, that dive sequence has, has now kind of, uh, is a feature of our laboratory. It explains what we're doing. It just happened to be that lovely moment where the animal did everything visually at the right time. And it's really, you know, understanding that video sequence, we still don't understand it, it drives our research, but it's also become a little bit, I might even say iconic. It's been on over 40 television programs and, you know, it, it's used a lot and it's been all over YouTube and all the rest. So a lot of people looked at it and said, the animal can't do anything. The guy must have fiddled with the video, but I took the video, it's totally untouched. It's the real thing. Animals are really sophisticated and beautiful. So that was, that might have been one of the highlights of my career, that field thing.